All right, y'all, welcome to what's probably our final lecture of the year. We're going to look at some recent events of the Middle East. Now, quick reminder about the Middle East. We've been talking about it for throughout the entire school year, but really what we've really been emphasizing and touching on is really the Middle East in the 20th century with the establishment of the new borders, creating the mandates that then became the new independent nations throughout the Middle East. Um, and that's stretching from North Africa all the way east to Afghanistan and Pakistan. The other big takeaway that we've been talking about a lot has been the rise of nationalism in the region, specifically after World War I and especially after World War II, with the rise of pan-Arabism as well as Islamism itself. Really an idea that focusing on um, the Arab identity, a Muslim identity primarily, although not throughout the entire region, and an identity that is not connected and frankly at times oppositional to the West, which makes sense when you think about some of the things that the West has done, i.e. trying to steal all their oil, putting coups um, and putting people in positions of power in places like Iran and elsewhere. Um, it makes sense. So by the time that we are really going to start focusing on these recent events in the more recent decades, the Middle East has started to create its own identity. And that's one of relative stability due to the fact that we're seeing the uh, majority of the countries ruled by strong autocratic leaders. Now, these are primarily either kings. Um, so we have a lot of hereditary rules, such as in um, Jordan and Saudi Arabia, the kingdoms thereof, as well as many countries that are ruled by presidents. Although notice that that term presidents is in quotation marks. And that's because most of those presidents are ruling as strong arm dictators. Um, although at times there are, you know, flirting with democracy and there are elements, there are elections, there are freedoms, etc. But those freedoms are not always guaranteed um, and not what we're familiar with um, in more Western countries. That being said, our Western countries are also not perfect examples of democracies. So what are we seeing in this region? We're seeing a lot of these um, rulers, a lot of these presidents ruling with force and using a lot of oppressive tactics. And what is the result of this? There are a lot of tensions in the region, as we'll see and as we've seen, but this strong armed way of ruling really reduces those tensions. It really puts a lid on those tensions, as we've seen with our reading about Iraq, um, that those tensions, they don't really have any space to grow because these leaders are oppressing them so much. As you see in countries from North Africa and Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, as well as in more central um the Middle East, um, the Arabian Peninsula, etc. <clears throat> so despite the fact that um, we see that this is a relatively stable region with a lot of rulers ruling for decades, majority of lives, uh, generations, as it were, um, there are exceptions. There are conflicts that um, happen in the region as well. So we have the Lebanese Civil War, which is a pretty brutal war in the early 1980s. Um, it's actually a religious war between Christians and Muslims in Lebanon. We have the eight-year war between Iran and Iraq, as we learned about, an incredibly brutal war that led to the death and devastation for millions of lives um, that, frankly, you could argue are still being impacted and still um, picking up the pieces from that war because it was not that long ago. We have the Gulf Wars, as we'll learn about in this lecture, as well as the continued Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which unfortunately, is still going on, um, 70 plus years strong at this point. And then finally, more recently, we had the Iranian Green Revolution, which was an early democratic revolution um, that swept the nation in 2009. That then resulted in the government really cracking down on the protesters and enforcing a more like martial law um, intense response, um, which is unfortunately a precursor to what we'll see a few years later with the Arab Spring. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit more about what's going on in the region in the early 2000s and late 90s. So by the time we get to 2000, Israel and Palestine, they've now had a conflict. Um, Israel has been in existence for 52 years without giving statehood, without giving sovereignty to the Palestinians, despite continued calls and frankly, at times promises to do so by the Israeli state. So by 2000, um, we have another attempt at peace, a second Camp David Accords. The first one went well, giving um, recognition of Israel by Egypt and reducing tensions, as well as having the Israelis put together a plan to give Palestinians some um, autonomy and self-rule. But by the 1980s, 
that Camp David Accord, those plans um, have fallen by the wayside. And we had the first Intifada, which was a civil disobedience, um, an uprising between the Palestinians. That then led to the Oslo Accords, which is the closest we've ever seen actual peace be organized and planned, um, an actual path for Palestinian statehood and um, a peace plan between what would become those two states. But unfortunately, with the assassination of Rabin, um, that peace plan went by the wayside um, and tensions then increase. So by 2000, when we have the second attempt at peace um, and it goes nowhere, um, the peace plan is rejected, tensions are going to increase to extreme levels. Combined with that is an event at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. <clears throat> now Jerusalem is a um, very important city for both Judaism, Christianity, um, as well as Islam. And in the East Jerusalem on the Temple Mount complex, which is also the site of the second temple of David, so incredibly important for um, Judaism. And I might be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure that's also where maybe the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be somewhere around there as well. But I'm not a religious scholar, so do not quote me on that. What I do know, very important area. Um, and as you can see here, um, you can see the remnants of um, the second temple. And then uh, David as well as this area, the Temple Mount. Now, this is incredibly important for Islam because when Muhammad um, became a prophet, part of his process of becoming a prophet was he was visited by the angel Gabriel, who then took him on a magical ride up to heaven. Muhammad rode, I'm going to say it's a Pegasus, flying horse. They go up to heaven. Muhammad sees heaven and all of its glorious entails and comes back to earth. And where he touches down to earth, is right here on this Temple Mount. So incredibly important Islam Muslim holy site. Only the most holy of holy Muslims can go there. So it's not a place for everyday people to attend. Ariel Sharon, who's the Israeli prime minister at this time, he goes there. He walks through it. Why? Because it's under Israeli control. This is seen as hugely disrespectful. It's a slap in the face of the Palestinians um, to basically be like, A, you haven't given us statehood. You keep promising. It keeps going nowhere. And now you're going to our holy sites and basically like walking through it with your infidel, um, non-holy Muslim personages. And that is going to spark the second intifada. Um, it's similar to the first in that it is an uprising against the Israeli government. Um, it is different in that it is extremely more violent. Um, we're going to see the use of suicide bombings incredibly common. People are going to basically strap explosives to their bodies and go to public places, markets, discotheques. When I was in Israel, I saw a burned out one. It was incredibly upsetting and horrifying to think about. Um, restaurants, and buses. So there is no way of controlling this. Um, and it is a period of extreme fear. And this is going to go on and off for several years in the early 2000s. Now, how is Israel going to respond? Unsurprisingly, they're going to use their very strong military, their very um, excessive amount of weapons, and use that with greater force to um, shut down the um, <clears throat> Palestinians. And this is going to perpetuate because when the Israelis are going to respond with force and kill Palestinians, Palestinians are then going to be upset because their family members, their community members have been killed. And then they're going to use more force against the Israelis. And the cycle continues, leading to the loss of thousands and thousands of lives, as you can see here um, in this chart up in the right. It's a really terrible time. Um, no one is right. No one is wrong. It is everybody is perpetuating and contributing to this. And that is my neutral stance um, about this conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, that you can really see that both have legitimate claims to the land and to their goals. Um, and both are making horrific actions, horrific decisions um, that is perpetuating the conflict and the violence. So to go into a little bit more detail about that, um, tensions are super high in the early 2000s. Um, Israel is going to also contribute to those tensions by building more settlements, which we remember are um, small Israeli communities, um, townships, etc., in the occupied territories of Gaza Strip, West Bank, and the Golan Heights. That's going to increase tension because um, it's not 
internationally sanctioned. Um, and it's basically, you know, taking more land away from the Palestinians who, if you go back to the initial partition plan of 1947, Palestinians were promised about 44% of this land. At this point, they're in like the low or below 30%, 27, I want to say. Um, and then with every time that you have more Israeli settlements, that's less land that the Palestinians have. So it's like they feel like it's taking more and more. Why are the Israelis doing this? for security and defense. The other thing the Israelis are gonna do at this time is they're gonna start building an actual wall, a separation barrier around the West Bank. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide so you can visually see this. So here we have the West Bank. <clears throat> um, and the first thing you note is this dotted line, dashed line. This is the original um, armistice line. So these are the original borders. And what you can see happening within the West Bank, A, all these little triangles, these are Israeli settlements. So you can see how they're really encroaching in and built throughout the West Bank. And then you're going to notice this red line. So following the second intifada um, to create a sense of security and peace, because many of the suicide bombings and bombers are coming from the West Bank as well as from the Gaza Strip. Um, and notice that Jerusalem is very close to the West Bank. So Israel is going to start building this wall. In some places, less populated, it's a chain link fence. Um, you know, or just <clears throat> a very minor security barrier. Around Jerusalem, this is a wall that's 20 feet high, three feet thick, thick um, in concrete. It is massive. And you'll notice what's happening is that this wall, when it gets too close to Jerusalem especially, is no longer following the border of the promised border between Israel and Palestine. But notice instead, this wall is encroaching into Palestine in some respects, encroaching in and cutting off communities. Um, here's a real funky one over here. So if you're a Palestinian and you live here and your family lives over here, you can no longer have a direct path of access to them. You're traveling around and around and around. And also along with a lot of these settlements comes security checkpoints, which means that the Palestinians do not have a lot of freedom of movement in the same way that the Israelis do. If you're a Palestinian and you are working in Jerusalem, and you're living in Bethlehem or Ramallah um, or Jericho, some of the largest refugee camps, um, it's going to be very difficult for you to get to your job because now you have to go through these major security checkpoints. So this is another way that the Palestinians see their citizenship as lessened to the Israelis. Um, and it's another reason why they are advocating to have their own independent country. Now, with violence coming out of Palestine and Gaza Strip, that is one of the arguments that Israel has for not continuing the peace process, because if you have your own country, you can create your own laws, your own economy, you can have your own military. And the Israelis are very worried about the Palestinians having their own military and being so close to their capital city and their important cities. So that is one of the reasons why this conflict continues and why it is so complicated. Um, a little bit more, what's happening in the early 2000s. In 2004, the Palestinian government is going to be split between two groups. We have Fatah, which is going to be more moderate, coming in the West Bank, and Hamas, which is going to be way more extreme at the Gaza Strip. And because these two have different goals, Fatah is going to be more willing to work with the Israelis, and Hamas much less so. Um, it's going to be hard to form a unity government, as well as hard to work with Israel. Because Israel is going to say, look, we'll work with you, but you don't even all want to work with us. So how can we work with you? and the situation continues to be complicated and problematic. Um, also in the early years of the 2000s, throughout the early aughts of the 2000s, we're also going to see wars essentially split, um, flare up between Israel and Gaza as well. Because what's going to happen is Israel's going to cut Gaza off from outside support, so they're literally going to um, not allow anyone to come in from Israel, no one from Egypt, and in fact, they're going to blockade the um, ocean around, so or the sea, I guess that's Mediterranean, so you can't send anything into Gaza. That's going to increase um, the living conditions, that's going to worsen the living conditions. Gaza Strip is only about 25 miles by 3 miles, so it's like the peninsula from San Francisco down to maybe like San Carlos, Belmont. Um, it's in the desert, so they need a lot of things brought in, and when Israel cuts off all of Gaza, that means they're not getting stuff in, like food, water, sanitation, hospital needs. So 
the people's lives are incredibly, incredibly um, living in poverty and um, in really extreme conditions. And as you can imagine, that's going to lead to a lot of extremity um, in response to Israel, which is then going to lead to Israel cutting more off of Gaza and limiting more. And it's going to perpetuate. You can see here um, just what's going on with rockets being um, flown out from Gaza. So it's not surprising that Hamas, which is living in Gaza, and there's about less than a million people who are living in this area, um, it's not surprising to see that they are super extreme and not wanting to work with Israel and having all these conflicts. Currently, right now in 2021, relative peace um, in that we're not seeing like outright war um, and outright conflicts occurring, but there are flare ups every once in a while, a rocket will be launched and the government, the Israeli government will respond with greater force, which will then lead to um, more conflict and more force for a period of time until um, some sort of ceasefire has been brokered and things calm down until the next time. Palestinians still do not have statehood um, and the Israelis are still um, not wanting to give that to them because who is in charge of the government? That's right, Netanyahu, the same one that wanted to repeal and successfully repeal the Oslo Accords. So a lot of complication um, between Israel and Palestine. <clears throat> now, what's the United States doing in this region? Well, we're invading the countries at times, um, specifically Iraq in 1991. And then in 2003, the United States is going to invade um, Iraq. Why? The first time, because Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Why? Because they wanted Kuwait's oil as well as access to the Persian Gulf. So um, the United States, as well as many international allies, invaded Iraq in response. This is a very short war, Operation Desert Storm. It ends with a ceasefire, as well as Iraq being destroyed by bombings, Kuwait being destroyed by bombings, and Saddam Hussein saying, who is that terrible dictator that we've been reading about, he's going to be left in power. So it's kind of a war that uh, Saddam wanted to basically annex Kuwait. He's not successful in it. And the Western um, world feels pretty good because they were able to stop Saddam from that plan. But they left him in power. And as we know, Saddam um, is a terrible, brutal dictator. So that's going to lead to some problems, which we're going to see arise in 2003 when the United States invades I Iraq again. Now, why did they invade Iraq this time? Because A, Saddam, brutal dictator, murdering millions of people, we know that he's a genocidal maniac, essentially. And more importantly for our government, for our then president, George W. Bush, there was the worry and the fear that um, Saddam was building weapons of mass destruction. Essentially, fear that we were or that um, Iraq was having nuclear weapons. So weapons of mass destruction, WMDs, this means nukes. So um, the United States is going to unilaterally invade Iraq, meaning that we did it on our own. Go America. Um, we're going to successfully capture Hussein, who's then going to be executed for crimes against humanity. Understandably, legitimately so, one might argue. Um, but once Saddam is gone, as we've looked in our readings, um, what's going to happen next? You know, Iraq does not have a stable democracy. Iraq has not been set up for success. It's been set up for failure because of the sykes pico um, and the tensions already in the Middle East. So when the conflict mostly ends and when the United States takes the majority of their presence out by 2011, um, things are not uh, at peace and the complications are going to continue as we'll see at that same year, we're going to see the Arab Spring um, as well as the rise of new terrorist groups that are going to emerge in the region, which we'll learn about more on Friday. So currently we still have a presence in the Middle East, but um, it's a very minor presence. Um, and we could say that the second Gulf War has largely ended, um, but how you would categorize that ending um, is up to interpretation. So, and then we see some maps here. We can see the effect of the Iraq War um, of that invasion. It is incredibly brutal. And not something that we think about too much. Why? Because it's not really affecting our country on the day to day. Um, but we wanna challenge ourselves as Conanderas to um, challenge that dominant narrative and make sure that we are paying attention to what is going on in the region. All right, let's move a little bit east and talk about um, the rise of the Taliban. So following the post-Soviet um, Afghan war, following that brutal war, we see that the country of Afghanistan is completely devastated. Um, millions have died, millions have left the country, and it's led it in 
political, economic, and social disarray, um, which is then going to lead a nice little power vacuum for a fun little group called the Students of Islamic Knowledge Movement to take over the country. This is called, another word for them, are the Taliban. Now, where the Taliban come out of? They grow out of the Soviet-Afghan War, out of the Mujahideen, these Afghani fighters that were trained by the Americans. Um, and they saw that the Soviet-Afghan War, this was a holy war for them um, to get rid of the Soviet presence in Afghanistan, that this is what their God wanted them to do to fight against the Soviets. So when the war ended, now what did they do? Well, they fought another war. They fought a civil war to take over the country, which they successfully do so by 1996. And what do they do once they take over the country? Well, they bring some changes. They are going to bring a traditional conservative Islamist. And remember, Islamism is different than Islam. Islamism is a central bastardization of Islam, um, a much more extreme version of the religion. So they're going to bring those values to um, Afghanistan. They're going to ban frivolous activities. You're not watching TV anymore. You're not listening to music. No music. Uh, and once the internet is there, you're not getting on the internet. Why? Because those might turn your head away from the traditional view of Islam, from this like hardcore perspective. Um, Satan might tempt you. So we got to get rid of all of that. And the traditional gender roles are going to be brought back. Men, you're wearing beards. Um, you are going back to a more traditional lifestyle. And women, you are staying at home. You are not getting educated. You are not working. Your job is to have good Muslim babies and never question anything. So it is a real conservative, real traditional gender roles. Essentially what they're doing is they want to bring back Afghanistan. They want to bring it back to the Islam and the culture of the 700s of Muhammad's time, where we saw a lot of these traditional gender roles and traditional experiences. The only problem is they're trying to do this in 1996. The world is very different, but they want to basically erase those previous 1300 years and bring it back. Um, so as you can imagine, some people are going to oppose this. Some people are going to question this. And what's going to happen to them? Extreme punishments. You're going to see public beatings, public executions. It is a common weekly occurrence. So um, there is a lot of ruling through fear. Um, and there's not a lot of um, access to be able to respond to this. Because especially for women, um, you've had all of your legal rights taken away from you, essentially. So um, there, you, what can you do? Um, it's really, really scary and problematic. And why is this also combined with an anti-Western sentiment? Well, because the United States, um, the continued support of Israel, um, the first Gulf War, as well as just the various other shenanigans that one might say the United States has played in the Middle East, it's not too surprising that um, the West is um, considered with a negative perspective at this time, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All right, and then that brings us to kind of our final um, concerning group of the time, because lest we think the Taliban is acting alone, they're not, because we also have Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is also going to grow out of the Soviet-Afghan war. Um, again, this holy war that God, their God had um, purported for them to fight against the Soviets. And when the war ends, now what did they do? Um, we know that Osama bin Laden was one of these Mujahideen. Um, <clears throat> and after the war, he's going to bounce out. He's actually going to head back to Saudi Arabia, which is where I believe he's from, or he's at least Saudi um, in heritage. Um, and they're going to look for other places to fight. So in 1989, bin Laden's going to take over the Al-Qaeda um, group, which had um, been formed years prior. And uh, he's really just going to take it to a global scale, that bin Laden, very uh, global thinker, um, and be responsible for many terrorist attacks around the world, Somalia, um, Kenya, Tanzania, Yemen, even the United States, the World Trade Center. Actually, the 2001 attack was not the first time the World Trade Center was bombed, um, less so in 1995. So you can see on that map, all the places that Al-Qaeda is um, just, you know, bombing and killing lives really brutally and terrible. It's really a global um, threat and organization. And then most famously, um, especially for the American perspective, in 2001, um, Al-Qaeda is going to attack the World Trade Center, one of the worst um, attacks, or the worst attack, um, one might say, on American soil. And what is going to be the response to this? 
Um, <clears throat> at this point, the Taliban is supporting Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden had um, been in Afghanistan um, during these attacks. So the United States is going to invade Afghanistan the next year. This is Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, it's going to be pretty successful. The Taliban's actually going to surrender um, within a couple months. Um, but bin Laden, he's going to escape into the countryside. It's a hugely mountainous um, rural region, especially between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and because he escapes, the United States is going to continue to uh, pursue him. And that's going to lead to this conflict continuing. The United States is also going to um, stay in Afghanistan to help restructure, rebuild the government, help um, form elections, help form the new government, etc. Again, we're trying to create a democracy, just like what we saw we tried to do um, in Iraq. Um, and just like with Iraq, uh, it's going to lead to some um, differing results. Um, things are relatively peaceful for a couple of years until 2006, where we see a flare up of violence, um, a lot more wars um, or conflicts break out in the United States. We have to really um, increase our troop presence. Um, and at the same time, the war is going to be extended informally into um, the rest of the region and specifically Pakistan. Now we're increasing our troops are sending a lot more bodies to the region, but we're also sending a lot more drones. Drones are going to be super successful because a it's hard to go through the mountains. Um, it's hard to get into these rural mountain towns, but it's easy to fly a tiny little drone that is packed with explosives over um, these areas. And what are they going to do? They're going to be able to fly over. Um, they literally um, go and like um, recruit video gamers for this because like they'll just have people that sit in like, you know, small rooms and it's like they're playing a video game and, you know, using the same tactics and whatnot. The only difference is, is that unlike a video game, they are killing actual people. And when I talk about actual people, I don't mean that they're killing combatants, although they do. They're killing a lot of civilians, men, women, and children. People that are living in these rural communities um, are being killed by the thousands because of these drones. President Obama, um, this is one of his lasting legacies that the drone in, was in usage was increased under his administration, um, which horrifically led to the deaths of thousands and has really increased tensions between our country and Pakistan. That is happening to this day. Incredibly problematic. Um, and incredibly heart-wrenching, frankly. In 2011, um, Osama bin Laden is going to be killed and the United States is going to reduce their troop presence. Um, recent years, there have been flares of violence, just like we've seen in other regions of the Middle East, other parts of it. Um, and the United States, we do have a troop presence, but we're working to leave. President Biden has actually said that on the 20th anniversary of 9-11, that is when the last troops will be um, brought out of Afghanistan and that war will officially end. We'll have to remain to see what will happen. So um, to sum up, you have a couple of reflection slides to complete. Um, and we will review this in class on Friday and then also pick up and talk about the other main event of the region, the Arab Spring. So I hope you um, enjoyed this lecture. I hope you're enjoying your asynchronous day and I'll see you in class soon. Bye.